Across the global automotive industry, a number of factors are converging to make things challenging for automakers and auto dealers. As brands pack more and more innovative technology into each new model year's vehicles, governmental and industry regulators work to keep up with the advances. That leads to changing safety and compliance guidelines, which complicate the already delicate but wide-scale issue of recall campaigns. Those are when vehicle owners are asked in mass to bring their cars in for service to fix a vulnerable part or update their car's software. Add to that the mounting disruptions to the supply chain. From production slowdowns brought on by the pandemic, shipping troubles due to everything from war in Europe, port logistics, and the notorious microchip shortage. It's pretty clear that those in the automotive business have a lot to contend with. But wait, wait there's, there's more. more. The chip shortages mean there are fewer new cars available for dealership lots, even while consumer demand increases. So OEMs need to pull out all the stops to put the finishing touches on new vehicles as those coveted chips come in. And part shortages mean vehicle owners have to wait longer for service, from tires to filters to collision or recall repairs. That places more pressure on the dealership's after-sales department, the parts and service people. And that would be hard enough, but on top of all of this, there's a shortage of automotive technicians. That's what we're gonna talk about today with Scott and Lori, two of GP's foremost experts on the global automotive after-sales market. Are you ready to perform at your highest potential? Welcome to the Performance Matters podcast from GP Strategies, your workforce transformation partner. In each episode, we'll interview industry experts and explore best practices and innovative insights to help your organization improve performance. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm your host, Michael Thiel, and today we're talking about overcoming the automotive technician shortage. This is a global issue, and to really address this, we at GP Strategies, we're a workforce transformation company. We work in all sectors. Automotive is a major sector, not only in North America, but around the world. So we wanted to bring in a couple of global automotive thought leaders when it comes to this topic. So I'm pleased to be joined here in the virtual studio by Scott McCormick. Scott is a vice president of the Southeast Asia and India sector. He is our automotive lead. Hi, Scott. How are you, sir? Michael Teal. I am good. Good to be with you. Uh, we are honored to have you. And then riding shotgun here, we have Lori Martin. He is the Asia Pacific Business Development Director at GP Strategies. How are you doing today? Or rather this evening, Lori? Uh, I'm good. Thanks, Michael. Good to hear from you again. Well, yeah, we are honored here. So we've got a lot to talk about. I want to just introduce our group to you two. You two have fantastic backgrounds. So, Scott, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. First of all, where's home for you? Well, I'm a New Zealander originally out of our New Zealand, Waikato province. Uh, but I call home today Bangkok and Thailand. Okay, Bangkok. And how about you, Lori? Where's home for you and where are you at right now? Home for me is also Bangkok, Thailand, because Thailand is a central hub to Asia Pacific. Um, but I'm Australian from Queensland. And right now I'm currently in Saigon, uh, actually working on some skill shortages issues here in Vietnam. Well, I want to thank you both for joining me here. I'm in Arizona, so I got up early. You stayed up late, so thank you for your flexibility. So let's talk about your bios. You both have very diverse backgrounds to qualify you to address today's topic here. So, Scott, let's start with you. Just share a little bit about your background, your bio, um, in terms of how you've come to where you're at. Yeah, Michael, it's all automotive. Uh, I've been in the automotive industry for coming up 30 years now. Um, started straight into uh, automotive out of out of university uh, and got a chance to to travel uh, because of that. I um, I left New Zealand and worked uh, in several country, countries across Southeast Asia, uh, India, Middle East, um, and then when I joined our company, it was in in China. Uh, had seven great years in Shanghai and uh, and moved back to to Bangkok for a second time about three years ago. So the, the automotive industry in Asia, Asia Pacific, uh, is very much what I've done. Um, I've worked across the, you know, the breadth of the, the market facing end of the business. So marketing, sales, service, retail, 
um, all of that. Mm. So that that's that's been my working life. What a diverse background. And, and Lori, how about you? I know we've had a chance to work on proposals in the past, but I've never had a chance to really just sit back and say, what makes Lori Lori in terms of your professional background? Yeah, sure, Michael. Um, it's fairly diverse. Um, I started off as a panel beater, so I came from the, the body shop industry. Um, and the body shop industry probably suffers acute shortages um, even now. Um, uh, I worked in that industry for about um, 15 to 20 years. Um, and where I was up in North Queensland in Australia, there were skill shortages, major skill shortages because of the mining. So I got heavily involved in um, attracting skills and developing workforces uh, to actually retain staff. And as a result of that, um, uh, I was um, asked to uh, participate in a technical college and I became chairman of an Australian technical college up in North Queensland. So I got involved in education um, through skills development. Uh, that then uh, led me to be uh, headhunted by the government to head up economic development and employment. So uh, I then started working uh, strategically on developing industries and building, uh, building up skills in about 21 different industries. And then uh, I was um, headhunted uh, uh, to work for a consulting company uh, and have been with GP, uh, formerly TTI, for the last 12 years, um, developing skills all the way from China to Asia-Pacific to through to the Middle East uh, and the Americas. So uh, here I am today. Yeah. Okay. So we need to find two more professionals. You two don't really have what it takes to really talk about today's topic. Uh, I'm really sorry about that. Um, so it's been nice talking to you too. So we're having fun here. I like to start this off also because you know what, we're, we're professionals, but we also have a life. So I want to know just one fun fact about you both, um, that you can reveal to our global listening audience. So just one fun fact, Scott, how about one about you? Oh, I I don't know how fun (laughs) it is, but I've lived in one, two, three, four, five, six, six different countries. And tried tried very hard to learn the languages in each of those countries with with uh, varying degrees of success. So I don't know wow. if that's fun, but it's a fact. That's you're the international man of mysteries. What I'm hearing, <laughs> Lori, like how that. about you? What's one fun fact about you? That's very impressive, by the way, Scott. Um, uh, I, I guess I'm a bit of a fun guy all around. But one fun fact is that uh, when I was around 21, I decided to catch a double decker bus from Kathmandu to London, uh, and that was going through India through Pakistan up to Afghanistan, across through Iran, uh, into eastern Turkey, and right through to Europe, where I where I worked in the UK uh, for a few years. So um, that set me off on my journey of exploration around the world, and I'm still out in the wilderness right now. That is amazing. So you've literally sung the song, I'm going to Kathmandu, is what you're saying. I've sung that many a time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Okay, so we've had some fun here. Let's talk about what we're really here to talk about, and that is overcoming the automotive technician shortage. So to set the table here, let's just identify the problem, all right, for those that are listening and driving, and they might not be in the automotive sector, but I guarantee you they're in a sector that has some sort of skill shortage here. So let's break this down. I've heard this in some conversations and seeing Yammer posts and everything about this. So I've heard you two, in in essence, break this down into three simple issues. So number one is basically a chronic technician shortage. A, A second thing I just had on my notes is, you know, that there's demand spikes happening in terms of recall campaigns, chip retrofits, that kind of thing. And maybe most concerningly is just customers defecting from dealership service departments. And obviously, for us that are former operators, you know, that hit to your all important CSI numbers and how that kind of creates a vicious cycle here. So, guys, can you talk a little bit, or, or I should say, gentlemen, can you talk a little bit more about these issues? Yeah, I'll, I'll pick that up, Michael. Um, you know, the chronic underlying issue here is the, is the technician shortage. So, there's not enough school graduates who are choosing to become you know, automotive technicians, mechanics as a career. So there's not enough to replace the technicians who are retiring, you know, or leaving the industry every year. Um, this this problem predates COVID. It predates the Great res- uh, Resignation. Yeah, uh, but okay. those things have just made this shortage worse, and so it, like it has for for many industries. So if you think about a service department and a dealership, they're managing as best they can now in normal times with you know probably a suboptimal you know. Uh, workforce in, in, in their in their workshop. 
And then along comes a service recall campaign. What what that means is that the the manufacturers you know identified a potential risk uh, in a, a vehicle, uh, you know maybe a manufacturing fault, a part defect, and they want to check all these vehicles uh, and maybe replace parts to make sure that they can be safely operated. Or, or maybe you've had a you know a major local event in an area like a flood, which brings a whole lot of vehicles into it. A, a workshop, but but either way, you've suddenly got this massive increase in the number of vehicles coming into the service department. Now, the biggest impact of that is actually the regular customers, not so much the recall customers. Hmm. So, if I if I'm a if I'm a regular customer and I, and I you know I'm going on my, my driving holiday this summer and I suddenly think oh, I better get my my vehicle serviced before I I do that. So I try to try to I call the, the the dealership, try to make an appointment, and and the service department says to me, "Look, sorry, it's going to be three weeks before we can get you in uh, to get your vehicle serviced." Your customer satisfaction takes a big hit, right? And then so I'm sitting there, the customer, and I think, okay, well, it's it's only an oil change and a filter change and and a safety check. Yeah, you know, I might go and check out that that quick service shop down the road because I've really got to get this done before my holiday. Uh, and maybe now that the dealer dealers lost me as a customer for good. So those are the types of challenges that hmm. we see coming with the technician shortage, um, and and it gets exacerbated in these spikes in demand. Lori, anything else that you'd want to add to that in terms of this this big picture problem? I know you've got a lot of insight in this world as well. Yeah, yeah, and I echo what's what um, Scott has mentioned, and and just widening it out. Um, you know, it, it is a global problem. Uh, you know. Um, in the developed markets like the US, like the UK, like Australia, like New Zealand uh, and China, um, uh, we're identifying skill shortages. Um, but we're also seeing that significantly in the emerging markets as well. Um, and that's that's not because there's a shortage of people. Um, there's a shortage of attracting people to the industry itself. Um, mm. So the first, but the first thing that we identify um, in this case is what what are the dealers doing to retain their existing staff? And some of the challenges faced with that is middle management or supervisors may not be equipped to actually manage a blue collar workforce. And as a result of that, um, there may be uh, um, discontent within the workplace. And then that, uh, then that encourages movement or transition uh, of technicians going from dealer to dealer. And with the skills shortages going on now, there's opportunities to step outside of the trade itself. So there really is um, some challenges from within the industry itself, as well as challenges, as Scott's mentioned, uh, school leavers coming into the into the trade. Let's talk a little bit about the evolution of the role of the technician. I mean, I know that right now we know that customers predominantly have internal combustion cars, but we know there's a pretty big shift onto the EV side of things. So I'm curious for you two on the global side, before we even talk about the shortage, let's just talk about the demand and the needs as that's shifting for technicians. Yeah, it's it's the it's the hot topic, right? And there is actually there, there's really strong consumer interest uh, in EVs. You know, they've got some some questions they want answered before they buy, but there's really strong interest. Now, from a servicing point of view, you know, it's important to uh, to say up front that even if tomorrow 100% of the new vehicles getting sold were EVs, we've still got this massive installed base of, of ICE vehicles, internal combustion engine vehicles on the road that are going to get serviced and repaired for, you know, for many, many years to come. So this this balance is just going to change slowly over time when it comes to the, the aftermarket. What it does when you look at, at the, the EVs is it really continues a trend that we've already been seeing. And that trend is the, the kind of work that a technician does, it really splits in two. So okay. first of all, there's going to be, be this very simple routine maintenance work. Uh, EVs are inherently a, a more simple vehicle that, than, a, than an ICE vehicle, Let, less to go wrong, less to fix. On the other hand, when something does go wrong, yeah, you're talking about really much more sophisticated electronic systems, ADAS systems, the, the whole the, the whole uh, interface, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the touch screens, all, all of the HMI that's changed. And that's when th- things go wrong there. That's becoming that's becoming much more demanding around uh, you know, the, the diagnostic capability and the technical capability that that the technician needs. And so this this is an opportunity, and this gets to the real heart of the technician recruitment problem. So um, we think of 
Yeah, a lot of, uh, say, people, school leavers, young graduates, they, they look at a technician job as a really manual, dirty, greasy job. And that's just not true anymore. So it, it, it's a very good point because it, it, it's a major challenge. You know, we hear a lot of requests, large requests for uh, technician shortages. We can't grow our business because we can't get technicians. But something that we're identifying very rapidly in relation to the way in which technicians or the age demographic of technicians coming in is the way in which they learn themselves, right? So we're in an era of of TikTok and uh, reels and fast learning. And as a result of that, to keep up the pace of learning, to feel like they're, they're engaged in the workplace, um, we have to change the way that we think about the way in which that we engage, uh, engage these staff to help retain them. So the days of actually training staff uh, in intervals uh, every three or six months doesn't engage the staff enough to retain them and feel like they're, they're uh, growing within the organization. So one part we see is that the, the rate of change of technology is requiring a, a certain level of skills, but the rate of learning needs to meet the challenge of these increased technologies. So certainly keeping them engaged and keeping them enthusiastic in the way in which they like to learn instead of the old traditional methods of face-to-face or, you know, one hour, two hour uh, WBTs is certainly allowing them to gamify the way in which they operate like they would play video games at home. Uh, and it's something that shouldn't be overlooked. That's so exciting when you think about this, this idea of adding more of that TikTok style flavor, the short burst over time, right? Versus versus the old, uh, I guess the anaconda style where you just gulp it down and, and then you wait for a while and then come back and, and find another thing. Maybe I'll, maybe I might edit that one out. I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Buddy, Scott okay. and I drank some, drank some snake wine on the weekend. Funny that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let's talk about another thing. And that is just managing short-term spikes in demand. So the fact is there's occasionally needs for greater technician capacity and whether that's at the ports, at the dealerships due to recalls or, you know, getting new shipments of chips. I don't know if you've heard about that. There's a little bit of a chip shortage in the automotive industry. So my question to you two thought leaders is how can OE, OEMs, i.e. the manufacturer or large dealership groups, tackle those kind of short-term burst needs without putting a bunch of new people on the payrolls. Just a tiny little challenge for you. Let's get some thoughts or let's dream up some solutions here. Yeah, so Michael, your, the, your last sentence there it really highlights the, the, the problems uh, when, when dealers especially are dealing, uh, trying to handle this kind of demand surge. So dealers typically hire for the long term. They hire, hire people they can train and develop into, into really strong technicians, master technicians, diagnostic technicians. And, and that's a good thing. They need to do that. But that's not the right tool to respond to a temporary demand surge. This was a, this was a problem that really attracted us because this whole topic of, of technician shortage is just so big and so multifaceted. It's, it's, the, it's the, the, the employer brand image, the industry brand image that you're trying to attract people, um, keep people in the industry, uh, generation gap, or you got all these things you're trying to deal with. It's just, it's a massive problem. But when we started to think about how do you tackle this this, you know, you, when you have this short-term surge uh, of demand and we and we realized that we had the tools to, to do it. And so, th- so that was quite exciting. So we, we have recently rolled out a service called Auto Flex Force. That's a cool name. Where did your workshop this name at? <laughs> well, <laughs> I we love some, it. We, it sounds we like it. Some, we have capes and everything. That is a super cool name. <laughs> um, that's that's one of those things that gets uh, that gets brainstormed around about thirty times until we come up with a name and and check through legal and all those <laughs> things to make sure that they you know we're not we're not standing on anyone else's toes who've already invented it. But it's, it kind of gets to the to the to the, um, to the crux of what we're trying to do. Yeah. So the idea here is that we 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 train people we we, we bring people and we train them to perform only the the recall repair that 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 mm. dealer or, or that that location is facing a surge on uh, for for that kind of work and, and then we place those people at at the dealership uh, for a for a, a period of time that the, the dealer needs them and we can we can recruit and train way faster than the dealers can here uh, for a number of reasons and then you know the dealers that they keep those people just as long as they need 
um, and no longer to get through that that temporary situation of a you know a, a, a recall campaign or something like that uh, to 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 handle that work and to not disrupt the rest of what they're doing. That is that's amazing. And now, is that something that we're that you are working on rolling out? They're in the uh, APAC region. We've we've rolled it out in the in the in the US already. We, we've got we've um, we've run uh, run a program already with a customer, and we're looking at at now, uh, you know, taking that idea and uh, doing first of all more work with it in North America, and then in other locations that need it as well. And and it's the it's the kind of idea I've found that when when we talk to people about it, it's yeah, they instantly get what what it's about because it just everybody who works in the industry understands the very real pain, and they, you know, they they figure out really quickly, man, if you can do this, uh, that's a that's a that's a solution to this one piece of this whole puzzle about uh, having enough people to do the work. So that's that brings up a good question for me, and that is the fact that. You know, this temporary thing, why is this not a DIY thing? So in other words, why can't, for example, manufacturers or dealers do this on their own? So what's the benefits of having a third party, for example, managing this process? So, I mean, that was a question we asked ourselves, you know, anything we try to do, you know, what, why would someone come to us and have us do, do this, do this for them? And, and as we've, as we've done it and, and we think about it more, you know, there's, there's, there's a few areas that, um, yeah, there's some real benefits of a, of, a, of a dealer or a manufacturer working with a specialist like like GP Strategies. So first of all, we've been in this business of staff augmentation in the auto industry for decades. So so bringing people on, training them, deploying them, you know, we, we know how to do that. It's kind of bread and butter for us. The second okay. thing is that, it sort of gets back to an earlier point, is that we're not trying to recruit individuals who, yeah, with the you know, desiring the talent to be a to be a master technician, gold technician within a dealership. We're recruiting and training people to f- perform this one operation only, and that's why we can do it faster. And then the other thing, because of that, th- that we can not only do it faster, but we can then reach into the workforce, into the population, into areas where dealers or OEMs generally don't want to go. They look, yeah. They're usually looking for someone full time who's go- going to stay with them and and develop. So, the, the types of examples of you know people we can attract, you know, all those technicians that have left, uh, yeah, some have retired. They just don't want the full time grind of forty plus hours a week um, on their feet in a, in a in a workshop. But a lot of them be happy to come and do a gig for you know a few weeks, a, a, a few months, uh, you know, supplement their income, and then go back to to doing whatever they've been doing. And then, yeah, you know, there's other people say, yeah, you know, there's people who started down the path in a technical college or something of, you know, training to be a technician for whatever reason, they, they couldn't complete that, you know, any number of, you know, personal family reasons, whatever. So this is a, an ideal second chance for, uh, for people like that. So, you know, the benefit for a dealer working with a third party like us is that we can, we can take on and manage those employment risks that, that you know, that dealer might not be comfortable doing. That's so interesting. Lori, have you had any involvement or perspective in this? I would say fortunately or unfortunately, uh, given my age, I've experienced a number of um, scenarios where this has happened. And, and while Scotty's talking about chip shortages and so on, where you need the spikes and you need this rapid workforce, I come from, a, from a, a similar angle, but in a different way in which natural disasters are increasing. Flood, typhoon, hurricane, tornadoes, right, where mm. we're mass populations of vehicles uh, are damaged, whether it be for body or uh, flood damage where you require transmission flushes and so on. And as a result of that, um, some of the challenges with natural disasters and floods, for example, is that you have to work on these vehicles very fast. Otherwise, corrosion sets in and the vehicle uh, is no good. So so um, I've experienced situations like this where we, we've been involved in cyclones or floods and we've had to process a thousand vehicles. And the way in which we do that, we know the model, we know that the logistics, we know what we need to do in relation to setting up uh, setting up warehouses, we know what we need in relation to 
um, making sure, for example, carpets are removed and not dried mm. out so they get mouldy. So as an example, we would hose the carpets every day to keep them wet to make sure they wouldn't go mouldy until it was time to work on them. So it's those kind of areas of expertise that you get to learn only from being involved <laughs> in natural disasters. And I was going to say, this is you're talking special forces level type things here. I mean, obviously it's in, it's in a different world than the military, but this is everything you're mentioning. These are nuances that you only would learn by messing it up a few times. Right. So that's, that's really fascinating. Correct. And, and look, it's this model is utilized uh, in other parts of injuries. For example, hail damage. There, there are there are organizations that fly around the world and uh, do PDR on hail damage. So this model isn't something unique and something new we've thought up. It's a different part of the business sector that, that we are equipped and qualified to handle. You know, we've talked about some aspects of this spike and this potential need for meeting this demand. So let's talk about one, and that would be in transit units. So, you know, we all know what it's like to fill a couple of extra service bays at a dealership's garage or add a couple of people to the line at a factory. But what about when you have huge numbers of unfinished vehicles that are in transit between a factory and a dealership. So as you guys know, you can't exactly park them, uh, let's say 100 incomplete cars on a dealer's lot. So how do you work on those cars without dedicated facilities? Yeah, this this is really topical because what you're seeing a lot of is uh, finished inventory sitting around because yeah, there's, there's one chip that's not available. So the vehicle's finished except for this one ship. Now, some manufacturers are taking the, yeah, the, the, the decision to delete options and ship those vehicles uh, without those options, which might never get put, get, get put back, uh, back on the vehicle. But, but in a lot of cases, there's a lot of finished inventory sitting around. For example, you know, you look in automotive news and they've got the, the drone or the helicopter picture of a parking lot filled with a certain OEM's cars just waiting for that one chip, right? Oh, yeah. And and you're talking, um, you, you don't need many cars there to add up. You, you've got yourself a $10 million, $100 million inventory problem of vehicles there that you can't ship, you can't realize revenue on until you, act, you actually complete the vehicle. So that's, yeah, th- this uh, this idea of, uh, of auto flex force we can we can take into that kind of environment uh, and we can actually manage it as a complete turnkey solution so how would that works um we we go and uh, you know set ourselves up in that in that holding yard in that location uh with the people we receive the vehicles receive the parts uh fit fit the parts ship the vehicles so um the yeah the 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 oems are, are are not set up to to do that all the time uh you know or, or you know, p- part of the time at, at a large scale so th- that's an area where where this can, uh these sort of skills can be brought to bear as well the other thing if you think about so that's a manufacturer if you think about an importer in any country so an importer so, yeah announces a, a a service recall or a service campaign uh on on vehicles that they've sold now there might be another couple of thousand vehicles uh on ships on the way on on the water to to the country and and those those uh, vehicles all need to have the the campaign applied to them before and yeah and and importers want to do all that they don't want to before they ship it to to the dealers so um, the other thing we can do is we can set up port side and run exactly that same uh, that same process uh, capture mm. all those vehicles get the get the fix done, uh, ship the vehicle. So we've got that ability to manage that whole process for the importer or the OEM from beginning to end. All right, gentlemen, you've been so generous with your time. I know it's in the evening over there. I'm sure you're probably pretty hungry and we're getting our day started here in Phoenix. So I want to just pose one other challenge to you and that's connecting with customers. And you know what? I'm a customer too. So here's a challenge I'm going to put out to you as thought leaders in this industry is, for example, I won't name the, the dealership or the OEM, but I went into my local dealership website to make a service appointment to give them money. And I went in there and plugged in my information and the first date, and by the way, it is currently July 28th. So this was July 27th, bear in mind, not to date this too much, but the first available date for service was September 16th. So you can imagine me as a customer wanting service Here, it happens to be in Arizona. I wasn't happy. What would you do, Lori? Um, I know we're talking tech shortages here, but what would you do as a uh, dealership if you were managing that place to help assuage that customer's 
dissatisfaction. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned tech shortage. You brought it back to tech shortages, Michael, because that is the case now. Um, you know, dealers are, dealer service reception is challenged right now because they can't process the number of vehicles through production. And as a result of that, uh, the pressure is put back on the service reception to be able to manage the customer. As as Scott's mentioned previously, some of these customers are long-term customers that, that have had the same service for many, many years. Part of the challenge is how do you overcome this? You are experiencing it right now. Um, <laughs> you, might have, you might have strong bonds and strong ties to your local dealer network. However, it's the way in which you're going to be treated in this process. So if you were to make that booking and you had no response from the dealer network or the dealer itself saying, look, we, we, we apologize, Michael, for this delay, um, but these are the issues that we're facing, right? So one, it addresses the problem first and foremost uh, and explains uh, openly what the, what the concern is. But secondly, when it is time to book the vehicle in and bring the vehicle in, um, the service reception needs to go that extra mile and provide you with an extra level of care and courtesy because of your patience in waiting. And usually that can be forgotten because the, the service reception is that busy as a result of overload of work uh, and trying to get the work in the workshop and out of the workshop in the scheduled time is going to be a challenge both before the vehicle comes in and while the vehicle's in the shop itself. So certainly educating the, the service reception at another level now to be able to meet those challenges, which differs from the challenges from previously where they were busy uh, and they could process the work. So certainly more education to, to the service reception. Yet another potential learning and development idea right there for us, huh? I think so. <laughs> and, and, and I think that the, you know, there's, there's a couple of, couple of you know, key principles in that. One is a transparency. I think customers today expect a level of transparency with the, the people they do business with. Um, and that can be transparency also with the business just saying, hey, here's an area, area we're, we're struggling. What your what your your dealership could have done is the the customer your relations executive however they're organised there could have could have been proactively calling you and said hey Michael you know based on your your last service and your mileage we need, we know you're due for a service about this time uh, we've got a six week waiting list right now so can we book you in for six weeks now if you'd got that call two weeks ago I think you 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 would have had a different experience. The, yeah, there's you know, there's real physical issues with dealing with this, like the number of technicians. But yeah, there, there's ways of you know changing the way we 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 handle customers in a proactive man, manner to to minimise the impact. One of the biggest challenges, uh, one of the important factors of uh, customer service is empathy, and that's one of the most challenging uh, most challenging attributes to actually be able to empathise with a customer um, about the situation that they're in. They could be a family of four or five with a wagon, and they need that vehicle, and as a result, they might not be able to use that vehicle because of the delays. So. Um, a greater understanding through empathy, which is no doubt challenging to learn and to deliver, is something that comes with integrity and personalization. Gentlemen, my head is spinning from this amazing conversation today. I can't thank you enough for sharing your wisdom and insight. So on behalf of our global listeners, we appreciate you so much. Have a wonderful evening. Great to be with you. <laughs> yep. Good to talk, Scotty. Bye, guys. The Performance Matters podcast is brought to you by GP Strategies. Together, we can create a world where business excellence makes possibilities achievable. You can subscribe to the show anywhere you get podcasts or listen on our website at gpstrategies.com.